موسى ونبي الله موسى was one of all the عزم what is what is who is نبي الله خدر and how was he in this position and how can we compare him to نبي الله موسى عليه السلام Uh, I think we had this question before, but uh, uh, for the new members of KLC, uh, Prophet Musa ala Nabiina wa Ali wa Alayhi Salam was aware that Khizr Alayhi Salam has some special gift. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, he told him, Hal at tabi'uka Allah and to alimane mimma ulimta rushda. Shall I follow you so that you would teach me from what you have been taught some guidance? So he knew that Khidr alayhi salam was someone that Allah directly taught him. He had some uh, knowledge which was not conventional. Ilmi ladunni. As the Quran says, Atainahum al ladunna ilma. So our ulama have this expression, Ilmi ladunni, means something that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had such knowledge. Even he had a knowledge about the things which were uh, not understood through ordinary rules and regulations of Sharia. Like for example, someone who has not yet you know, made any crime according to Sharia, this person does not deserve punishment and this is true. But there are some other rulings that only Allah and people who are connected to him can decide about it. That if this person is going to create problem, for example, for his parents in future, Allah may decide to take away his life. This is not a decision in the court or decision you know, by a judge or a jurist. No one can make such decision in a court or no jurist can make this fatwa. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make this. As he made decision that Ibrahim should slaughter Ismail. No one else can make such decision or demand such a thing. And Khizr was aware of these rulings. So he had deep connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Musa alayhi salam at that time maybe didn't have uh, you know, this appointment as Nabi and Rasul and Ulul Azm. Maybe this was a younger stage of his life, and later he reached that level of Nubuva and Rasala. Also, we know that even prophets, they are not all the same. There's a chance that maybe some prophets have more gifts, or in some areas they have more strengths. Thank you very much, Shahar Karim. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one uh, question, uh, Brother Farooq, are you uh, able to connect? Uh, he, ha he was saying that he will be able to connect. Akhi Farooq, can you hear us? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as salam. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Dear Sheikh, thank you so much for your lecture. I'm, I'm driving, so are you yes. able to hear me? Okay. Yes, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for the, the explanation today. I have a philosophical question yes. regarding the, 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 the concept of risk. Yes. And as you were explaining the concept of risk, I was thinking about Yazid, for example. Yes. Yeah, so, he, so after Karbala, you know, if I'm not mistaken, historically, he had three years. He lived, I think, if I'm not mistaken, three years after. Altogether so three so years. He, all together three years after Karbala? Is that no, correct? no, including. Oh, including. Okay. So as I was thinking about the idea of risk, so, so he, you know, after his all his evil actions, he continued to be able to get food and water and drink and, and, and then, you know, have his own whatever he needs to sort of live for those times. 
Yes. So, is, so, so, was, was, was all of that was that would that be considered philosophically as blessings from Allah that He was receiving, or was that just a design of free will? And because the universe is created as free, free will, so then He, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala let Him live for that amount of time, but whatever He was getting from this world was out of the, the design of, of, of free will. Of course, his life was from Allah, but the rest, uh, if he had worked and got something halal or was gifted to him, then it was his rest. But if he was misusing uh, public money of Muslims and putting himself in a position that he didn't qualify for, so this was not his rest. Okay, so I think I, I think I now understand the definition better. So, so when we define risk, we're really defining risk as what you have earned versus what is received from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yes. So risk has to be pleasant, has to be halal and tayyib. And for every person, there is a way to get such risk. But if they are not patient, or if they, you know, want to get more, etc., or if they don't want to work, then they may eat too much or get, you know, lots of things. But this is not risk. Risk has to be halal and tayyib. And the key for it is that you have exposed yourself through, you know, working, through, you know, making efforts, expose yourself to that. So if I uh, lock, if I lock in myself to a room and I don't do anything, I say, no, Allah should send me risk. No, you will die in that room. There's a great chance that risk would not come. But if I expose myself with some work, with some, you know, just make myself available. Uh, like, for example, sun is shining, but you have to expose yourself. Uh, blessings of Allah are so coming. You have to expose yourself. So with some work, with some uh, patience, then I will get that halal and tayyib uh, sustenance. Jazakumullah for uh, the explanation of, of... Thank you very uh, much for a good question. Thank you so much for your lecture. Ah, Jazakumullah khairan. May you arrive, yes. inshallah, safely. Uh, last question for today, uh, we have uh, Sister Anna from Ottawa. I have a question that I don't know how to formulate well, but basically, what is the politics or policy of Islam in relation to old traditions of people that are regarded as pagan traditions? What if there is no decisive proof that these traditions have anything to do with idolatry, or there is no decisive proof that idolatry was even there? For example, Musa salam spoke to fire, but it didn't make him a fire worshiper. So what would be a sufficient proof to look down upon something or to outlaw it? And what is the view on Muslims observing those traditions? Uh, of course, Musa salam didn't speak to fire. He had conversation with Allah, uh, not with uh, fire. Maybe you mean this. So we have to allow people to express their belief this is the best thing so if we have someone today a pagan for example we say okay what do you believe let them express themselves if they believe in a way that with some flexibility we can classify it as the faith in god then they are believers if with all flexibility what they say is not something that we can classify it as a faith in one personal God, then we have uh, to say that they are not uh, you know, believers in God. But 